Hey there, fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. In honor of the Super Bowl this coming Sunday and the fact that it's Black History Month, Synergy, we'll be tackling the recent brouhaha churned up by fired and unhired Dolphins head coach Brian Flores. Is the NFL racist? Is the Rooney Rule racist? And what should the Christian response be to this? Come join me as we fill some quotas and check some boxes. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your NFL commissioner today as we appropriate some culture. So if you haven't been following what's been going on in NFL sports news, I'm going to use an article from David French as a springboard, as he does an adequate enough job of describing it, but also because he's a self-professing Christian and we wildly differ on the topic. His article entitled, The NFL Has a Good Old Boy Problem, starts this way. One of the most troubling realities of American life can be summed up in a single sentence. Systems and structures designed by racists for racist reasons are often maintained by non-racists for non-racist reasons. This reality applies both to formal legal rules and to informal cultural norms. But how does this process work culturally? For a prime example, I direct your attention to the bombshell lawsuit that former Miami Dolphins football coach Brian Flores filed against the NFL and the Dolphins on Monday. The heart of the suit is an allegation that NFL teams systematically discriminate against black applicants for coaching and front office positions. Moreover, it says that the NFL's efforts to increase diversity, namely through the so-called Rooney Rule, which requires teams to interview at least one black applicant for open general manager, head coach, and senior assistant coach positions, is little more than a cynical sham. Wow, it's quite impressive to get so many things wrong in just one sentence. First of all, it's not the so-called Rooney Rule. It's the Rooney Rule. That's officially what it's called. It's on the website and everything. And it's not a misnomer. It's not like they called it the totally fair and always equal outcomes rule. It's called the Rooney Rule after Dan Rooney, whose name was Dan Rooney, not so-called Dan Rooney. Second of all, they're not required to interview at least one black applicant. No, they're required to interview at least one minority candidate. Doesn't have to be black. And actually, in 2021, the NFL made changes requiring that every team needs to interview at least two, not one, two external minority candidates for open head coaching positions. Researching is hard, I know. But one thing you did get right is the NFL does systematically discriminate. You just got the race wrong. It actually is against whites. The NFL openly, actively, aggressively discriminates and gives preferential treatment and opportunity to non-whites. It's called the Rooney Rule. Very official. It's on the website and everything. Not only does the league require interviews of minorities for prominent positions, but it also gives draft picks as compensation if your minority coach or executive gets poached for another team. Quote, if a team lost a minority executive or coach to another team, that team would receive a third round compensatory pick for two years. If a team lost both a coach and a personnel member, it would receive a third round compensatory pick for three years. That's pretty good incentive. So the NFL is not systematically against black applicants. It systematically advocates for black and minority applicants. But it's a sham process. Oh yeah, the rules might be written to benefit someone like Brian Flores, but the reality is, in this system, someone like Brian Flores will never be a head coach. I mean, yeah, technically Brian Flores was a head coach for three seasons. I'm sorry, I lost the thread. What is this lawsuit about again? Help me out, Brian Flores. Uh, and I'm doing it um, because I think about my, 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 my two boys and my daughter. Um, and there's, there just simply isn't enough representation um, of people who look like them um, in head coaching roles, in general manager roles, in executive and president roles in the National Football League. Uh, and I want them to be able to uh, uh, look at those roles. I want them to be able to, to, to look and, and, and believe that they can, they can get into a role like that. And that's simply not the case right now. So you're doing this because your children don't have any examples that they can look to. There's no one that looks like them who has ascended to the heights of a head coach in the NFL. Well, I mean, I can think of at least one person that looks like them who's managed it. One might even say there's a familial resemblance in that you were a head coach for three years. 
Well, let's be honest here. Brian Flores' kids have a much, 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 much better chance of being an NFL head coach one day than mine do. Now look, the Rooney Rule does come with its share of awkwardness. Back to Frenchie. The anecdotal evidence of a sham process is deeply embarrassing to the NFL. The headline-making paragraphs of the complaint contain screenshots of text messages from New England Patriots coach Bill Belichick purportedly congratulating Flores for securing the New York Giants coaching job. There were two problems with these messages. First, Belichick was mistakenly texting the wrong Brian. He thought he was talking to Brian Dable, the white candidate who actually landed the position. Second, he messaged Flores three days before Flores was scheduled to interview for that same position. The interview seemed to be a formality, a box-checking exercise, before the team announced the decision it had apparently already made. Oof. We now go to Bill Belichick for comment. Bill, you care to comment on how you texted the wrong Brian? Bill really doesn't like phones. So there is an issue here. When you give people boxes to check, sometimes they're just going to check the boxes. Again, they are required by the NFL to conduct interviews of minorities. And I can imagine that doesn't feel great to go in for an interview for a job you know you're not going to get, like the time I auditioned for the Chippendales. I mean, when I auditioned for pastoring. If you want to avoid the risk of people just checking boxes, then you're going to have to get rid of the box checking requirement. But notice how white man David French reduces Brian Dable to just the white candidate as if that's the only reason he got the job. Or maybe Joe Shane, who was the assistant GM at Buffalo, where Brian Dable was the offensive coordinator. So he knows Dable and he trusts Dable more. Maybe that's part of it. Nepotism is definitely a part of the NFL, but nepotism isn't strictly racist. Or maybe they wanted an offensive-minded coach to help out Daniel Jones and Brian Flores is a defense guy. Or maybe it's because when the Brian Flores' defense went up against the Brian Dable's offense, the record was 0-6. and six. Maybe that's why. Or maybe it's because when all Brian Flores' Dolphins had to do was win and they'd be in the playoffs, they lost 56-26 to 26 at the hands of Matt Barkley and the Buffalo Bill backups. Maybe that's why. Maybe it's because in three years as a head coach, your team never won the Super Bowl, never won the division, never won a playoff game, never even went to the playoffs. Maybe. Chances at a head coach gig don't come around much. Brian Flores was given that chance for three seasons. It didn't work out. But back to French. The complaint also contains claims that a 2019 Flores interview with the Denver Broncos was another transparent sham. Broncos general manager John Elway and president and CEO Joe Ellis allegedly arrived an hour late. Even worse, Flores claims, they looked completely disheveled and it was obvious that they had been drinking heavily the night before. Moreover, it was clear from the substance of the interview that Mr. Flores was interviewed only because of the Rooney Rule, and that the Broncos never had any intention to consider him as a legitimate candidate for the job. So John Elway is a racist, and so was Joe Ellis, and clearly the Broncos would never hire a black head coach. Compelling evidence, except for the small, teeny, tiny little detail that the job that Brian Flores was interviewing for was to replace head coach Vance Joseph, who I am told is black. I don't know, I don't see color. Now, I suppose it's possible that the Vance Joseph experience was so terrible that John Elway became a rabid racist. Or maybe, and equally plausible, the Broncos front office is not against hiring black head coaches, they just didn't want to hire Brian Flores. But they're required by the league to interview minorities, and so they check the box. That kind of sucks. Sure. But if you want to get rid of box-checking interviews, then you're going to have to get rid of box-checking policies. David French doesn't want that. But he continues, It is entirely possible that the lawsuit will uncover evidence that some of that racism didn't go away, but instead went underground. But it's also probable that there's something else at play something even harder to combat than explicit racial discrimination. A culture that unintentionally but still systematically prevents black coaches from advancing. I'm talking about an old-fashioned good old boy network. When those networks and relationships are exclusively or almost exclusively white for generations, then patterns are established. Want evidence of a good old boy network? Look at the staggering NFL nepotism stats. As Kalen Collar wrote last month in Defector, overall, the league averages 3.4 coaches per team who are related to a current or former NFL coach. And the percentage of coaches at the supervisor levels, the ones with hiring power, is even higher.
Yeah, there's nepotism, clearly. And you're never going to get rid of that. There are only 32 teams. These are highly competitive fields. And if you are so fortunate as to land a GM position or a head coaching position and finally achieve your dream, you don't want to screw it up. And so you're going to be more likely to turn to people that you know, that you trust, that you believe in, rather than taking a shot in the dark on someone you interviewed but don't really know. A part of the reason things didn't work out in Miami with the Dolphins is because the GM, who by the way is black, I'm told, was very clearly not on the same page as Brian Flores. That kind of stuff matters. But what exactly is the evidence that nepotism is creating a racial problem? Here's what people like French point to. The statistical evidence demonstrates extraordinary underrepresentation of black coaches and executives. While 70% of NFL players are black, only one out of 32 teams employs a black head coach. Six out of 32 teams employ a black general manager. So 70% of NFL players are black, and yet there's only one black head coach. Well, two now. Lovey Smith was just hired by the Texans. Also, the Dolphins hired Mike McDaniel, who was biracial. His father was black. Does that count? Well, either way, a compensatory pick is on the way to the 49ers. But here's the problem with this statistical manipulation. Yeah, 70% of NFL players are black, which nobody has a problem with that racial disparity, but NFL players are not the pool of candidates in selecting a head coach. So the racial makeup of the NFL players is irrelevant. Only a third of NFL head coaches ever played in the league. And the most commonly highly regarded head coaches today, people like uh, Bill Belichick, Andy Reid, Sean McDermott, Mike Tomlin, Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, John Harbaugh, Pete Carroll, Bruce Arians, and one Mr. Brian Flores never played a single snap in the NFL. Being a really good player does not mean you're a really good coach. There is zero correlation there. But what about this notion that the pool of candidates isn't diverse enough? Well, the most common pathway to become a head coach is to be either an offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator. So let's take a look at the league. Bills, Leslie Frazier, assistant head coach and defensive coordinator. He also was a head coach. Browns, Joe Woods, D.C. Colts, Marcus Brady, O.C. Chiefs, Eric Bieniemy, O.C. Chargers, Ronaldo Hill, D.C. Giants, Patrick Graham, D.C. Bears, Allen Williams, D.C. Lions, Aaron Glenn, D.C. Bucks, Brian Lefwich, O.C. And Todd Bowles, D.C. Cardinals, Vance Joseph, D.C. Rams, Raheem Morris, D.C. 49ers, D'Amico Ryans, D.C. All right, now let's throw in the minority head coaches. Steelers, Mike Tomlin. Redskin Commanders, Ron Rivera. Jets, Robert Sala. Texans, Lovey Smith. Dolphins, Mike McDaniel. It counts. 17 teams right there have a minority and a prominent position of leadership. And that's not out of 32, it's really 17 out of 25, because currently, at the time of this recording, the Patriots, Jaguars, Broncos, Raiders, Vikings, Seahawks, and Saints are not fully staffed yet at those positions. So a little math. About 68%. So 70% of the players are black, 68% of teams that are fully staffed have a minority in leadership. Seems decent. But will that lead to head coaching opportunities? Probably. These things ebb and flow. In 2018, there were eight minority head coaches. But what exactly is David's French answer to this? And no, I don't believe in racial discrimination to reverse racial discrimination. You do, though. That's what the Rooney Rule is. It discriminates based on race and gives preferential treatment to people of color and compensates teams with draft picks based on the race of coaches. But one doesn't have to discriminate against a single white person to change the culture of the NFL or any number of elite American workplaces. The league can decide to be aggressively fair. It can expand its circle, and any circle that's fairly expanded will give black coaches the chances they so richly deserve. How much more aggressive can the Rooney Rule be? Should we just give the Lombardi to whatever team has the most diverse staff? And frankly, David, just looking at the faces of the dispatch, maybe you guys should really institute a Rooney rule and expand your circle because it's far less diverse than any NFL coaching staff. See, here's the thing. The most bothersome aspect of this is that calling someone racist or calling an institution racist or an organization racist is that racism is one of the most vile things in the world. And so to wantonly accuse people of that or to level that charge on the flimsiest of evidence is not loving your neighbor or your enemy. You know, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity describes loving your enemy as hoping for their best. And he points to something that I think is relevant here. Suppose one reads a story of filthy atrocities in the paper. Then suppose that something turns up, suggesting that the story might not be quite true or not quite so bad as it was made out. 
Is one's first feeling, thank God, even they aren't so bad as that? Or is it a feeling of disappointment, and even a determination to cling to the first story for the sheer pleasure of thinking that your enemies are as bad as possible? If it is the second, then it is, I am afraid, the first step in a process which, if followed to the end, will make us into devils. You see, one is beginning to wish that black was a little blacker. If we give that wish its head, later on we shall wish to see gray as black and then to see white itself as black. Finally, we shall insist on seeing everything, God and our friends and ourselves included, as bad, and not be able to stop doing it. We shall be fixed forever in a universe of pure hatred." And that's the problem I have with David French's analysis. It's wishing that black were a little blacker. Bad analogy when dealing with race. But you get my point. We're supposed to think that the NFL is a viciously racist enterprise, despite the rules in place to the contrary, and all because a black man didn't get the head coaching gig even though he was a head coach in the NFL until about 15 minutes ago. What kind of Christian charity is that? It's clinging to a narrative for the sheer pleasure of thinking that the NFL and America and corporations and white people are as bad as possible. No thanks. Well, that'll do for today. Uh, follow me on the major socials, like, share, subscribe, rate, and review, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture.